Hello, everyone, and welcome to the final session of the Podcast Advertising Industry Summit. This session, we're going to be talking about using data to succeed with host reads. My name is Ayana Angel, and I am the host of the Switch, Pivot, or Quit podcast. So I do have some experience with host reads. So I'm very excited for this conversation, as I hope you all are. And I'm going to introduce our panelists quickly. And if all of our panelists can just give a quick wave when I say your name, that'd be awesome. So first up, we have Jack Hobbs, who's the president of Revolver Podcast. Dave Newmark, CEO. CEO of Pod Search Inc., Hillary Ross, VP of Podcast Media at Veritone One, Giles Martin, EVP of Client Strategy and Media Operations at Oxford Road, Marshall Williams, partner and CEO at Ad Results Media, and Bruce, Bruce Sapovit, SVP Sales Director of National Audio Services at Nielsen. Okay. We're going to start off with Dave. So Dave, Edison Research reports that podcasts reach about 100 million people each month and broadcast radio reaches over 300 million people. So podcasting reaches about a third of the radio reach. You would think ad revenue for podcasts would be similar or a third to the uh, ad revenue for radio, but it isn't. Radio generates about 15 billion in ad revenue and podcasting generates about 500 million, um, according to IAB, that is. So can you tell us, Dave, why is that? I think uh, the disparity of audience and revenue can uh, best be understood uh, in, the, in the idea that radio is a local market medium. Uh, in fact, uh, and Bruce knows this well, <clears throat> being at Nielsen, 90% uh, of radio advertising is from local advertisers on local stations and local markets, but podcasts are mostly national or international. And so while there's some technologies to enable advertisers and agencies uh, to isolate ads into certain markets, it really doesn't get to scale in any single market, which is really what local advertisers need. So I think that the big question looking forward really is how can the podcast industry get their fair share of revenue based on the audience that it has. And um, I think the answer is with national advertisers, but right now I don't think it's just with any national advertisers. Um, there are two types as I see it. Um, one is direct response advertisers and the other is brand. And I don't think brand advertisers are gonna start spending big money until they have strong audience identification and targeting technology and really strong uh, and widely used uh, tools for attribution to measure return on ad spend. I heard uh, Rocky Thomas in the previous uh, panel talking a little bit about pod sites, and I think that has a lot of promise. Um, and, and in fact, some big brands are starting to spend, uh, as Media Radar uh, reported last January, um, big brands are doing some standard uh, announcer reads, and they're spending about 2% of their budget on host reads. So um, if Brand advertisers aren't quite ready to open their wallets uh, and, and bring in the big dollars. Who will? And I think that's really the direct response advertisers. Um, and host reads are how they're going to do it. Uh, they're spending uh, well over 75, again, use, quoting that the media radar uh, research, well over 75% of their budgets on host reads. And I think that host reads are really powerful because their voices uh, of the show aren't just employees of the station. The podcast hosts are generally the owners of the shows. And so when the uh, you know, hosts personalize a commercial message, it's personal and it carries the credibility of that host. And so I think it's our job as ad agencies and industry people to work as hard as we can to bring the power of this incredible medium to many, many more advertisers with the experience and the technology tools that they need to succeed. Mm -hmm. One other observation, um, if I may, um, on the disparity between the re ad revenue from radio and from podcast is, you know, radio has a very heavy ad load. So there may be three or four or five breaks an hour, and each one of those breaks may have several minutes of advertising in it. So you've got perhaps 10, 15, 20 minutes an hour of commercial time, all of which can be monetized in the podcast world. You might have a pre-roll at the beginning of a 60 minute uh, show, a mid-roll in the middle, and maybe even an abbreviated end roll. So you've got maybe two minutes of ad time um, in the 60 minutes. So there's probably a five, 10 X difference right there in terms of um, the disparity on ad time 
which accounts for a lot of that gap in revenue. I think as the radio companies become more and more heavily entrenched into the space, which they already are now, I think a big question for the industry is, are they gonna be pushing podcasters to have a heavier ad load? And I think the question that podcasters have to uh, wrestle with is, to what extent am I comfortable of that? How much of that is um, you know, damaging to my relationship with my audience? And, and you know, what's that balance between you know, content quality and monetization? Absolutely. I want to jump over to tools briefly, um, since, you know, it was mentioned already by Dave, just sort of like how the tools that we can use. Bruce, can you chime in here and tell us a little bit about what tools exist that can help brands connect with the right podcast based on their yeah. audience and what they're looking to achieve? Sure. So, you know, there's a lot of rankers out there. We don't do a ranker. There are rankers. People, people can get their downloads, you know, uh, first party, third party data. The tools that we, we're working with are to help the advertisers move into the space, uh, whether it be a DR or a brand for that matter. Uh, we do two things, uh, ad effectiveness studies, sometimes called brand lift studies. And those are where we, we test the creative and we see whether the ad resonated, whether it be host read or not, uh, whether the ad resonated, there was referral, there was recommendation, whether people responded favorably to the ad, and the effectiveness of how the spot was created in that environment. We do this for a lot of podcasters who get asked to do this by a lot of agencies, and we're seeing the volume really tick up. So when I see volume tick up on these studies, to me, that's a very positive thing for the podcasting business. It means that those brands really want to come in and learn more about, you know, the effectiveness of the medium. The second thing, we introduced something called the podcast buying power about a year ago. And it's tied to our Scarborough data. And it really, uh, for an agency person, as well as a podcast seller, it's a direct tie back to somebody's consumer habits. So it's one thing to ask a survey, like how many hours do you listen? How many shows do you listen to? Even what's your favorite genre? What this database does is you can go in there by department store, by financial service, by automotive brand, any number of categories, there's 2,000 categories, and you can index to see how the, the podcast listener is doing compared to the average consumer and or, and or how a certain genre is doing compared to podcast listeners, and in many cases, even the show. So it helps put some guardrails around the space for someone coming in to kind of figure out how to connect their consumer with the podcast listener in a very direct way. So it's, it's a great uh, pre-buy planning tool. Mm -hmm. So Hillary, I wanna have you jump in here. And I know that, you know, what Bruce is talking about is, is a service that, you know, maybe not everyone is ready to invest in. Maybe they're not at that space in their um, podcast advertising journey. So the pod, since the podcast catalog has increased a lot in the last two years, how do you think people can identify uh, the right podcast partners maybe to invest their money in? Do you have any thoughts on that? I do, yeah, sorry. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Perfect. Um, yeah, you know, I think it's been really great seeing over the past couple of years how much more diversity and genre and voices have really come into the podcasting space. Um, and, you know, I think there's a lot of data that we definitely leverage when we're looking for these opportunities um, for our brands, both internal and external. And I think one of the really important things to, to hone in on, especially since kind of the heart of what we're talking about here is host reads, is the authenticity of those post when they're reading for brands. Um, so something we always do for, for our clients is we have these conversations with our network partners, with the show teams to determine which placements and which host um, can really speak authentically for, for our brands because we know that that authenticity from the host, um, is really, it really speaks volumes to their listeners and therefore also, um, you know, we see a direct correlation with performance results on the back end. Um, so definitely making sure we're leveraging that um, when seeking out opportunities. You know, it's it's always important to re to remember that just because we're seeking out, you know, business minded individuals, they're not necessarily listening to business podcasts um, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So anybody feel free to jump in here. 
because of the current racial climate that we're in right now, are you guys noticing or are you um, doing anything different maybe to tap into the data to understand how you can target or um, how ads may be more effective in the African-American communities, in the Latinx communities, and with just people of color, are you seeing any shifts with how people are buying or looking to uh, maybe tap into ads based off of what's happening right now and just kind of like the conversation around racial sensitivity? Well, since I, I kind of fall right into that category, I appreciate maybe there's a, a layup for me. Thank you so much. <laughs> that's uh, a, that's first of all, I, I just want to say thank you for to the summit and Francesco and you know you guys at Box Nest and, and Ivy and everyone. You guys did a great job putting this together. So thank you so much. You know, it's it's it's. it's, it's see the changes in in terms of how this whole. Uh, this whole business has, you know, really morphed in the last couple of years. Um, it's a great time to be in a space. Um, and, you know, when you look at things, just an hour ago, you had Edison doing a, a survey release. I don't know if they were trying to take our thunder here or not, but uh, they were doing a Latino, they were trying to take a, a, do a they did a Latino uh, information release, uh, podcast release, which was very uh, encouraging as well, being that, uh, you know, I'm in the Latino side. But to, to answer your question, uh, you know, we're zeroing in on the, the beachfront property right here. This is, uh, you know, with host reads, uh, you know, you have to align with the right host uh, and, and also the right show. Um, you know, that, that's the, the most important thing. Now, is that an English language host or is that a Spanish language host? My, my, you know, my, my uh, Spanish language content is, is some of the, the most popular in, in, the, in the country and does extremely well. Not highly pressure against their inventory. Um, but, you know, I'm starting to see signs over the last four or five weeks when everything has started to, to bubble up, um, the, the interest between Latino and our AA uh, content has uh, significantly, significantly uh, been, uh, been raised from an awareness standpoint. Uh, we've, you know, we've added guys like Montel Williams and, uh, you know, our over over at Viacom, Love and Hip Hop, and that sort of thing have definitely uh, uh, been been uh, looked at and, and discussed in, in plans. So you know, it's uh, the the audience buying space is, versus the show buying space is, is definitely starting to uh, I think bubble up uh, uh, nicely. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll also uh, contribute a little bit, Ayana, if I may. Um, sure. I started another division of the company. Um, called start a pod and it's uh to encourage people who want their voices to be heard uh, to to find out how to start a podcast and also to uh be able to monetize it through advertising and uh, we just started about three months ago and we are just we just spun it up and i'm very excited we've got uh, people subscribing like mad and uh i'm really excited for it because i think that this will give people whose voices may not have been heard in podcast form uh, a chance to be heard and seen uh, by our company for uh, advertising purposes. So I'm really hoping that uh, over the course of the next few weeks and months, especially frankly uh, leading up to the election, uh, mm -hmm. that we get um, voices of color who, uh, you know, um, have the, they have uh, a lot to say and they should say it and they should get monetized. Absolutely. Yeah, we're, uh, Dave, to your point, we are getting definitely that interest on the uh, on the campaign side. Um, not saying that a lot of my uh, my talents are accepting of of a current uh, <laughs> current candidate, more so on the other side, but it's it's definitely um, uh, it's definitely uh, exciting. Let's put it that way. Yeah, the uh, the, the the people of color, persons of color, uh, definitely are going to make a difference in this in, in this election, and that's I think going to be a monster monster category. So, Marshall, one of the uh, main blockers for further investment is the measurement. So what do you think the industry should be doing better or maybe could be doing better um, and faster than before in terms of well, measurement? Uh, um, well, I, I, um, first, uh, the, Jack, I'm, I'm very pleased that you're seeing some real traction with your programming. Um, our, our company has been in the radio space previously, and we were host red ads on radio, and then we pivoted to the podcast space some 10 years or so ago. And the connective tissue that takes place between a host and the audience is what we're really talking about here. That's why host-read ads are such are so attractive to our clients. People will listen to these hosts, 
and whether they are infuriated by them or entertained or uh, driven by them or whatever, they will react. And that's really the connective tissue that takes place. So I'm really happy that what you're doing, which is Hispanic and AA to a certain extent is starting to gain some traction. That makes me very happy. And that's the way it should be. It should replicate radio in the context of the formatics that are out there. Okay, so so I'm happy to see that. I'm, I'm anxious to see that segment grow. So back to um, the measurement, the the metrics. And the, the, the currency we have all agreed upon are downloads for uh, podcasting. It is how we quantify what we pay because we buy on a cost per thousand basis. So downloads and having a, 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 an agreed to set of metrics and a currency that we can all say is great um, and agree to, whether it's perfect or not, uh, right, Bruce, um, is um, a different story, but it has to be agreed to. So the IAB came out with their V2 standard, and that's pretty much the essence of what we're talking about in terms of downloads, downloads now. It's important that everybody gets on the same page because the big agencies where the brand dollars are going to come from, which are going to really drive revenue, are going to look at that criteria as critical. Okay, so that's the audience level. The secondary part of that, because we represent a lot of direct-to-consumer brands and ones that look at cost per acquisition numbers and things like that, is quantifying response. And at first it was, you know, kind of the old school, hey, mention my code, use my name at checkout, so on and so forth. But we found some new tools and somebody mentioned PodSites, which is a pixel-based attribution tool um, that have come into play in the last year or so, which have helped. I don't think they're perfect yet, but they have helped quantify results relative to, oh, a podcast was delivered, somebody consumed it, and they went to my website, and I can do the math in a linear basis between the download and response, okay? We do, there's a couple of things, and, and Bruce's team is, and, and companies like his are working on further attributes from that to try and quantify not just the pre-buy analytics of what, okay, this reaches somebody who's in the market to perhaps buy a new car or might go grocery shopping for beer category or whatever, but it can also be used to look at brand lift going forward, brand aid, uh, aided and unaided brand awareness. So the bigger package companies that are out there are going to look at that data and go, wait a minute, this is the future of spoken word and I need to be part of that. And that's how we accelerate that growth in the podcasting space with those tools. Awesome. Awesome. Giles, I want you to jump in here. <laughs> Are there any benchmarks that we can use to help us evaluate our investing efforts when it comes to host reads or maybe why host reads in particular? Well, I think you know, as an advertiser, the most important benchmarks you can have are, um, you know, compar comparative uh, advertisers, comparable advertisers. Um, if you're working with an agency, they should have a data set that you can use for benchmarking. Um, you can obviously, as you start to expand your podcast investments, uh, you can build benchmarks of your own and you can compare one host's performance to another and one host's read to another. Um, you know, Hillary touched on this, but one of the things I think that's, you know, so critical for podcasts is, and particularly for live reads is just, you know, the authenticity and the spontaneity that you just don't get in so many other media channels. And we've had hosts, um, you know, talk for two or three or four. In fact, I think I heard today that we recently had a read that was seven minutes long for an advertiser paying for 60 seconds of, so, you know, I think if you can quantify that authenticity, that passion, like how long is that read? Like how emotional is that read? How personalized is that read? I think if you can create, um, you know, a way of tracking and measuring those types of softer metrics, those can be really, really valuable benchmarks as well to look at alongside your, your performance benchmarks. Mm -hmm. You're exactly right. Just as a host myself, every time I do a read, and just for those who may not understand why we're kind of going back and forth between saying live reads and host reads, it's the same thing. Um, it's, it's just kind of like you can't exactly do it live because it's all recorded anyway. So it's a host read. But when I'm doing a host read, I never hit 60 seconds. 
I always go over because I infuse my personality, the things that I want to say in my experience with whatever the brand or product or service is. And I think that is a part of the authenticity, just making that connection too. And I want it to feel real for my audience and let them know what my true experience is and say it in my words versus just sounding like I'm reading copy. So you're exactly right. I never go seven minutes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So do you guys have, feel free anyone to jump in here. Do you have any feelings about brands and whether they should have a voice in podcasting or is it better if they support the movement and sponsor podcasts that already exist? We all know that there's a lot of brand branded podcasts out there and that space I feel like is continuously growing and obvious, obviously it's a revenue stream for some podcast networks, um, but how do you all feel about them getting into the space as brands, especially some of the brands who have been previously podcast advertising themselves and then transferring over into the space of podcasting themselves? Do you look at it as a 30 minute commercial or do you look at it as content and, and create? I mean, when you, when you have programs that are providing news, whether uh, information, Hollywood, uh, finance, whatever. Okay, that's information, news you can use, and so forth. Is it, you know, then if you're going into 30 minutes of, excuse me, for all, uh, with all due respect, fidelity. If they're going to talk about fidelity 401s for, for 39 minutes, is that, is that entertainment or is that, a, is that a paid, you know, 39 minute show? I, I have a, a thought about it. I'll just uh, share. Thanks, Jack. Uh, you know, I, I, I sort of pivoting on that. I, I think it's an exciting time in that space uh, because of the evolution. Uh, you talked about growth, Ayana, but I, I also look at it as evolution. Um, I think about, you know, uh, when Slate came out with the message, for example, for GE, uh, that was very, uh, you know, brand oriented. They didn't mention GE at all. It was just very, um, it was very big brand like, let's just say that, and, and it went for, I think, two or three years. Uh, and they were really behind it uh, during those growth years for GE. And then on the other side of that evolution is a, a, a company like Trader Joe's, where uh, they're you know executing every day and and talking about you know kind of in a funny way uh, some of the products and, and things that they've they've brought in. So I think really uh, what it comes down to in terms of whether it's going to be a successful uh, venture or not, uh, and it, it does require a commitment, capital C for the for the brand uh, in terms of cost and, and effort and time. Um, has to do with execution. And so um, those who uh, are getting into that uh, really need to be careful about uh, choosing the right partner. Great. Okay. One other thought for me, if I, if I may, Anna. Um, I feel that, you know, pop podcasting's popularity has exploded so much in the last two to three years, particularly. I believe that there's 1.2, 1.3 million podcasts now in the, in the total podcast universe. I think, you know, a lot of marketers looking out there see, oh, well, look, I should create my own podcast. Like this is a trend. This has got momentum. This is a bandwagon. I should jump, jump on it. I think marketers um, have a tendency to jump on shiny bandwagons whenever they get a chance. And there are definitely some examples of marketers that have done a really, really great job. Right. Um, GE is a great one. Trader Joe's, you know, has also been prominent. Um, I particularly like the hackable one by McAfee. And, but these guys have partnered with, you know, professional production companies to really produce really, really great content. And um, that's hard for a lot of smaller and direct to consumer brands to do. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think the ultimate truth, and you know this as well as, as anyone probably as a, as a host is it's easy to produce audio content. Like you just need a microphone and a computer and, you know, but the, the challenge is really growing that audience. And that's a tough grind. Like you've got to be really, really committed. And I think it's easy for brands to say, oh yeah, I want to do a podcast and not think through what's their plan for growing that audience. Are they really in it to win it? Are they really committed? And so I think that's the big decision that brands right. need to make before they jump into this space. Yeah, yeah I think just that's, echo. go ahead, Hillary. Feel free to chime in. Oh, good. Just to echo that point real quick. Um, I think, you know, brands really need to know what their objective is when they go into doing a branded podcast. If their objective is to sell product or, um, you know, have a, a very specific ROI on that um, campaign, 
maybe a branded podcast is not the best move for you. But if your objective is to raise awareness of your brand, or, you know, we've actually had a couple of clients use podcasting as um, an internal um, tool to promote specific cultures or, um, you know, kind of share with new trainees, et cetera. So I think depending on what your objective is, you have to be really clear and, and defined about that before you decide to embark on a branded podcast. Right. It is, um, as David alluded to, it can be quite expensive. Um, a Trader Joe's one is not that it was expensive, but it was the way it was uh, manifested was 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 inside the, you know the kind of the mechanics of a of a of a niche organization that people were oftentimes fascinated with, and it it had great stickiness to it. Again, as Jack mentioned, if you're just going to be a 30 minute infomercial, that's not going to have a lot of stickiness. So I think it needs to be kind of tangential to. As Hillary mentioned, what are your goals? Tangential to the to the space, but not be an overt commercial. Uh, branded podcasting has a place out there. It can be expensive, as mentioned, um, but it uh, it's it's got to be done correctly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely agree with everything you all said. Uh, I know that I consult with people about creating podcasts from the indie side to the corporate side, and and that's my main thing. For me, with my podcast, Switch, Pivot, or Quit, when people ask me how I've grown, and I'm indie, and it's all of my growth has been organic. I have never done any paid advertising or anything, and I think I do fairly good numbers, but that is because there is a through line with my podcast, and it's something that resonates with me, so then it resonates with other people because I convey it in the messaging and everything that I do even down to the live reads or host reads that I do as well. So it all has to make sense. And I think the key there is that authenticity in it had, because if you're authentic with it, you can continue to convey and you can continue to connect with the people that you're trying to connect with that perfect audience. So let's yeah, get into- we, we, um, we, We've ahead. seen that too in the brand list studies that we've done for people mm -hmm. that, you know, even with the live reads, there are, there are very effective live reads and there's some that aren't so effective, even by the, personality who's very well known. I mean, and, um, it, you know, it's a fine line in coaching a personality on how to do an effective live read because they want to stay within their character and, and do it the way their audience wants to, to, to believe in. But just like a, just like a branded uh, po podcast, even when you do a ad campaign, you still want to have clear objectives. The agency and the advertiser wants to have clear objectives. Is this, is this a call to action campaign? Is it just brand awareness? What other media am I using? Because if you're only isolating on podcasting, but you're also advertising on television, how do you how do you isolate whether the, that that campaign was was the one that moved the needle or not? So when we do our campaigns, our brand lift studies, we do a collaborative effort with the agency or advertiser, the podcaster, and with Nielsen, we do a kickoff call that makes sure that when we do our survey, we're all asking the right questions. We're we're getting the questions that really need to be solve for to be answered for and the and the results are uh, always very interesting absolutely and i'll just say this from a host perspective um sometimes when ads come in or advertisers come in i sometimes i wonder what the objective is and i also wonder you know okay if you're if you're going to spend uh, do a limited ad spend are you really taking the time to invest in this audience being my audience to see what the potential conversion can be versus just throwing things against the wall and seeing what sticks? So I think that's also something good for potential advertisers thinking about getting into the space to really consider maybe you should take the time to invest with a couple shows and really see if there could be longevity in a relationship because you also have to remember that the consumer is not stupid. They know that it's an ad. They know that they like this person who's delivering the ad, but maybe they don't tr know, like, and trust you yet as a brand. So give them a chance to get to know you as a brand. Maybe they've never even heard of you before, and this is their first introduction by listening to this podcast. So sometimes I think you have to give it some space to allow it to work as well. Before we go, I want to just let, allow anyone to chime in on this topic of dynamic ads and baked in ads. Um, does anyone have any thoughts in terms of how you're approaching it when you're thinking about doing an ad spin or how you are thinking that it's working within the space right now? Because some people don't even really know the difference and don't understand that you know a dynamic ad is something that can be inserted 
anywhere in your back catalog in your evergreen episodes. And a baked in ad is something that's just going to stay in that particular episode. And although it may be evergreen content and people will listen to it, that ad is not going anywhere. And do you guys put more value on one versus the other? Anybody feel free to chime in. That's, that's, that's a whole separate, uh, <laughs> that's another <laughs> webinar. Yeah. Let's go another hour. <laughs> yeah. Two more we got to do. Uh, ultimately, and, and Giles mentioned this earlier, um, we the, the the inventory load that radio has versus podcasting is part of what separates the revenue dollars. Um, I I have I've said this since the beginning. I think there is a host right ads of the beachfront property. Okay, you doing your ads in that first person where you enjoy the product and there's a real connective tissue between you and the product and the and the audience has to be manifest in 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 true host red ads. Um, there is a place. For dynamic ad insertion which is an ad 30 60 seconds that could be in a third party voice or host voice that could be dropped in okay be dropped in and removed based on time periods or impression delivery or download delivery or what have you. there is a place for that it does not in our minds it does not carry the same value as a host red ad the performance hasn't isn't yielded in the same fashion but i do think that we need to be careful of not radioizing podcasting. I don't want to get to a point where we've got four and five commercials at the 15 minute mark of an hour long podcast. I think that will be detrimental to the space. And also because it's an opt in medium, I think it'll drive audience away. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, they didn't, they didn't, it's not the only opportunity for them to listen to that sports content or whatever it may be. So they can go somewhere else. We have to be careful not to do that. Yeah, I'll just I'll pipe in and, and just uh, uh, echo to some extent what Marsh is saying about uh, not wanting uh, to, to lose the magic of that so-called beachfront uh, property and so forth. But um, for those people who are podcasters listening to this uh, webinar, uh, I would say that there, there can also be a happy medium uh, if, they, uh, if they just choose to use dynamic ad insertion. Their host read ads but they're dynamically ad inserted, they can leave it, they can work with their hosting company to essentially program it so that it stays in the episode for, you know, five, eight, 10, 12 weeks, whatever they decide and negotiate with the buyer. But as long as it's in there for a while, uh, then you can pick up, and, and I'd like, you know, Marshall, uh, Giles, and Hillary to, to comment on this as well. But basically, as long as there's enough of a tail in there, you won't. Most of the people who are listening to the episode are listening uh, in a fairly short window, but there are people who are listening to that same episode over a longer period of time. So as long as it's, it's in there for a number of weeks, it can be dynamically uh, removed, so to speak, uh, but as, you know, it'll help. Yeah, Dave, I think you definitely touched on a good point there. There's almost um, three types of ads when you really break it down from a high level. There's evergreen ads that are embedded in content indefinitely. Um, and then there are these baked in ads that could live either within a specific episode um, or and be removed at a certain amount of time. And then there's dynamic ads that can either be flighted across first run or the full catalog of shows. Um, you know, as from a media perspective, there's definitely a different value associated with each type of ad read, which I know Marshall touched on. Um, and so when media buyers are approaching each opportunity, there's definitely a different approach taken for each. Um, you know, with evergreen ads, we see, I see drag coming through from spots that were purchased years ago. Um, so there's definitely a really strong long tail there, but I think with this new baked in hybrid approach, you're able to mimic that long tail effect, right. but you're utilizing dynamic ad technology. Yeah, but Hillary, that's a, that's a good point. You know, the, uh, the, the, the big word that I always see is perpetuity and I, and I go, ah, I, I, I cringe. And, and most of the talents nowadays are, are you know, the, the producers are like, look, is there a way we can do this plus end of flight plus six, end of flight plus eight months. Um, and that's where we've been, we've been <coughs> going in, in order to, to keep, you know, the producers happy as well as the agencies. Cause you know how, how important it is to keep Marshall, Hillary, Gabe, and you know, all you guys happy. Um, in order to keep the agencies happy, you know, how it works. So, you know, trying to come up with some type of a standard in that, um, in, in, in that, in that delivery, because, you know, we want it to be successful as well from a media standpoint. We, the, the worst thing you can ever hear is, look, this, this shit didn't run, it didn't work. And, and you know, we're, and we're out and, and we lose either a, a valued client or, or a relationship and they don't come back for a year. So, you know, like our, our goal is to do, 
end of flight plus six months or end of flight plus eight months and then and then and then manually uh, remove um, unless you know there's some other uh, reasoning to keep it in longer um, but uh, you know that's you know, one one point I just wanted to throw out there is, you know, as we as we are moving through this, and, and Bruce, you, you've been a, a great proponent of this of this during from the get go. Is you know, we really have to start getting the, the metrics that everyone from an agency standpoint and from a media standpoint all agree upon. Um, you know, because that's going to start building the brand. Look, the, the agencies that are represented here have done incredible job. Being, in new advertisers, uh, you know the the, the, the Molson Coors folks and 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 all of that, and you know that that from a, for a beer to come in, it was it was incredible, um, and and you know that will also go back to having a metric, and we're gonna have to show that as we go forward, um, and you know just take my word for it is not is not a is not a solution for success, um, and you know we definitely are gonna have to look at something uh, in order to move the needle to show the needles being moved, um, and that's. Um, you know, go ahead, Marshall. You got something to say? I know it. I, I just, I know, I know we got Ivy's down here in the corner, so we got to wrap up here in a second. Okay. Uh, by the way, Jack played Major League Baseball at one point, just so everybody knows he's our there's own celebrity. <laughs> oh my God, I'll never live it down. Here, I'll show you my Jack Cobb wall of shame over here in my man cave. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for all of your input you. and your insights. It's been an amazing conversation. We look forward to continuing the conversation, continuing to try and figure out what these metrics need to be. And um, we appreciate you for joining us at the Podcast Advertising Industry Summit presented by VoxNet.